40 years ago, I thought I was the only kid in the Northeast trying to carve his way into a, a role in professional motorsports. I found out there was another kid in the Northeast trying to do the same thing. He was on the mechanical side of it. I was trying to be on the PR side of it. My friend Ray Everham. We both spent a nice career, mostly around NASCAR, and then we both got away from NASCAR and got into old cars. So Ray, I know you're a busy dude, man. Thanks for allowing us to visit you. Thomas, always great to see you. I, you know, we go back so far, always telling the stories, you, you know, of how we, we've worked together for a long time. Tom actually got me my first ever personal services agreement in NASCAR, and we've been friends. Introduced me to the Amelia Island Concours, which I don't know if I want to thank him or not, because I've spent an <laughs> awful lot of money or an awful lot of time mm -hmm. restoring classic cars, but we both appreciate history so much. Every time we get together, it, the conversation runs on much longer <laughs> than, than we ever want to talk about. So Ray has a collection of memorabilia that I thought would make an interesting barn find hunter a little bit different than usual. Like for instance, we're standing in front of this door. Now tell me what this door is all about. These doors are something that, again, that I always wanted to have, and they are, um, so we've got things stacked around, but they are the original doors. Uh, the Indianapolis garages, they tore down to put up the current garages. These doors are really collectible, and I wanted them, and they were gone. Like, you've got to wait till they either come up for sale, or unfortunately, somebody passes away, and, and you know, unfortunately, somebody did pass away, and we bought these from the auction. You can still see a sticker on them, but they are, they are again, one of my prized possessions, because it's there's just something about Indianapolis history mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. it just gets me in. So I had them build a little facade of what it would have looked like here, but Guess who knows Alley, who right? passed? Yeah, who knows who passed through these doors? Is Tail Fabi, John Andretti, you know, who? The Valvoline sticker? Was that, was that Al, Al Jr.? You know, it's just really, really neat stuff. Are they post-war? So these garages were built after the fire, right? Remember they had a huge fire at yeah, ND, okay. and so these garages would have been built sometime, I'm guessing, in the 30s, 40s. They were that old. And then later on, when they decided to redo everything, they disassembled them, but they've kept a lot of the, kept a lot of doors. You'll, you'll see these in Speedy Bill's museum. Actually, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, has a couple sets left, and they built the facades. So, so it could have been A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti, I mean, Jimmy knows? Clark, Dan yeah. Gurney. Wow. Yeah, you know, or guys like that I'm really interested in, right? Clint Bronner, George Bignotti, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the mechanics, you know. The drivers would walk in and out of there once in a while, but those mechanical guys, they live behind these doors. You know, they, they actually actually would rent spaces at that time and build their cars and work all year long in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway wow. garages. So really, a lot of super famous cars were built right there and stayed in the Indy garages. How big a garage would have been? Roughly? Uh, no, uh, unfortunately, we we are limited more on space. Yeah. Um, and okay. as I told you, I apologize for everything being in disarray, but 50 years of hoarding, collecting, whatever, yeah. uh, we're trying to sort through everything and ID it now, but this garage would have been a little bit smaller and it, 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 it would actually have been turned the other way, but we really want to hang memorabilia up in here. We uh, had just finished a, an IndyCar restoration that I was going to put in here, but somebody fell in love with it and bought it, so now i got to find another one. But, you know, we're putting some things in here, memorabilia-wise, that are, uh, again, really significant. That's one of the original Gurney Westlake 289 Fords. This was would have been built probably around 67 uh, development, you know, and the slide injectors on this right here were hand-built by Stuart Hilborn as a... a prototype at that time. Really pretty cool. And then later on when Westlake, uh, this is a car, this is a, a motor from a, was going to be a, a Chrysler IndyCar motor and there were all, uh, only three of those prototypes. So was made. that like a, based on a 340 or what, uh, what did you Based think? on a, I, I, you know, I'm not sure if it was 340 or 318 base because they were only allowed 265 cubic inches, I think, at that time. So they had to de-stroke and, and do some things. But I just thought, it, again, it was really cool. People are like, what are you going to do with that? I was like, well, look at it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, to, to me, hanging on to the racing and being able to share those stories. We've been, sports been good to us. And part of our responsibility is doing what you're doing, telling the stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But something that may interest you before we run out of here. All oh, Chris Economakis. Chris Economakis pit passes. Jeez. Did you grow up, I mean, I know you did, and I did too, watching Wide World of Sports. 
I did. With Chris uh, Economaki. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Economaki. Live from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. All right, so we have a big building here to look at. Yeah. Lots yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Today's sponsor is Consumer Cellular. They reached out to us because they, they dig barn finds, but they also dig barn find people like you. They know the money that you save each month on your cellular plan, you could invest in your barn find. New wheels, tires, rebuild that motor. It's a no-brainer. So to save money for your next project car, check out the link in the description below. So what, I'm looking at modifieds, I'm looking at IROC, I'm looking at a little bit of everything here. What, what do you got here? Oh, you're right, we got everything. My, my collection is a lot like me, it, eclectic, I'm all over the place, but IROC has always been special for me. If it wasn't for Jay Signori and Roger Penske giving me a chance at IROC, I don't know where I'd be. I was racing at Wall Stadium, barely, barely making it. They moved IROC to uh, Tinton Falls, New Jersey. I went and asked for a job and, and got one. Wow. And, uh, those cars there are first generation Camaro. Um, that was driven by James Hunt, Brian Redman, AJ Foyt. Uh, James Hunt actually owned that car. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Brian Redman actually owned that oh, car for a while. Wow. And um, so IROC started 1973 with Porsches, and then they wanted to go the Camaros. Porsches were very expensive, still very expensive if you can, can get one. Jeez. But those Camaros were actually bodies in white uh, from Chevrolet, sent down to Banjo Matthews. He put roll cages and what in them, came back up to Penske. Penske's guys who did all the Trans Am work finished them, and they ran these from 74 to uh, 75 and 6. Richard Petty, they started running these at Daytona. Richard Petty said, you cats, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. you cats are going to have to build something a little bit more like a stock car or one of us is going to get hurt. Because they had, had a couple bad wrecks with these things, Riverside, places like that. Mm -hmm. So they went to Banjo Matthews and had him build these cars, like the 02 car and that 15 car. But they raced these uh, from 77 to 80. And if you remember, there was a big crash at Atlanta. Mario, a big crash on the oh, last yeah. lap, wrecked a bunch of cars. IROC took a, about a three-year hiatus and then that's when I went to work for them, December of 83. This car is actually... Uh, that's 40 a, years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You started Trust when me. you were five years old, right? Yeah, well, that's what I keep telling everybody. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, when you said 40, I was like, you're being generous, Tom. We were a little bit older than that. But uh, this is actually an Avenger, but it started out as a Generation 3 Camaro. One of the cars that I built, this was one of our practice cars. And, 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 uh, so, so they were serial numbers, and you could actually oh yeah, go back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This this car started life as a Camaro, and, uh, and then it became a Dodge Daytona, finally a Dodge Avenger. And if you look, that that just gives you an idea of the the drivers that drove this thing. This car is a two seat uh, uh, car. We still use it to, to play with. We take it up to VIR and and have some fun with it. But, you know, I actually built this car in 1984. Some of my original welds and fabrication are still on it. And, you know, for several years at IROC, I did a lot of, if not most of, the aluminum welding, especially when we did radiators and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then even when I started the number 24 car with Jeff Gordon, for the first uh, one or two years there, I was the aluminum welder. And now that my eyes are gone, it's, I'm not the aluminum welder anymore. So have you... Did you buy these cars as is? Have you restored them? What's the deal with these? We're working on restoring um, some. This what we do is we, we buy them. This car is really original, and we it's so original in fact that we had the original motor in it, and it's over at Pro Motor being done right now because it sat for 30 years now. Really, you know, th to me these cars are what the next big thing is going to be because you know as well as I do, it's 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 almost impossible to to find or be able to afford a car that has some great driver so you're, ahead, you're ahead of the curve here hopefully cool well that'd be the first time in my life <laughs> <laughs> and this car i never worked on the firebirds but that car actually ran in the last ever iroc race 2006. that's ryan newman there. ryan newman okay. drove that one yeah so this car i bet a lot of people watching this program have seen this car somewhere you ran didn't you run pike's peak with it This car, uh, actually, we won our class at Pikes Peak in uh, 2018 with it. We took it to uh, a an HSR race at Daytona International <laughs> Speedway, where Mr. Uh, France said, you probably need not to bring that thing back. <laughs> because they put me in with about uh, 50 Porsches and Mercedes and things like that. We qualified third and finished third. Uh, you know, racing you, you against You drove them. it. I drove it, yeah. And, uh, 
pretty amazingly quick. Bill Elliott driven it. <laughs> Boris said, uh, Boris said, <laughs> said, it is, it is, he said, the wildest car this he's ever sick. driven. This is um, like a Can-Am car, isn't it? It runs, uh, it, it, it runs in the low minute and 22 second bracket at uh, Road Atlanta with me driving it. So if we were to put, uh, you know, a Mike Skeen or one of the guys that helps us out in it, you know, it'd probably run much faster than that. It's about 850 horsepower, it weighs 2,500 pounds, and it makes almost 3,000 pounds of downforce at 180 miles an hour. It is a steel, it is a real 1936 Chevy body that we, you know, took out of, you know, bought it, came out of Kansas, chopped, channeled. Um, all of this is, is handcrafted aluminum to the front. They're, the only carbon fiber on this car is the skirts. Everything else is metal. So did I hear that this was clocked at 200 at Daytona? Uh, on the well, they're exaggerating. It was really only 196. <laughs> <laughs> With you driving? Yes, sir. Holy we, we pulled out of the, you know, and that was from, uh, you know, the bus stop at Daytona. That was on the road course. Yeah. Bus stop at Daytona to entering turn one where they put the radar thing, 196. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really a pretty special car. Man. So it is, it is uh, run at Indianapolis on the road course. Um, it is run <laughs> VIR. And it also, we shipped it to New Zealand where it ran a, a hill climb over there. Uh, With you driving? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so here's your modified collection. Again, sorry that they're, they're still, we've been doing so much construction here, we're trying to keep the dust off of them, but that actually is Richie Evans' uh, oh, car boy. that he was, um, it was on the backup uh, the day that Richie lost his life at Martinsville. Yep. And that is still owned by Richie's family, Billy Nazowitz and, and, uh, and um, his wife, Lynn. So that car was at the NASCAR Hall of Fame uh, with Richie and his family needed a place to put it. And I, it's an honor to have it here. Fantastic. And then the car next to it, believe it or not, is the White Lightning. That is the car that Jeff Bodine won so many races in and got him back, I think, discovered into NASCAR. And it's also the car, if you remember the famous picture of Richie Evans up on the wall at Martinsville and Bodine is on, that is that car. So I, I, I thought it fitting that these two cars mm. sit side by side. This Jim Hendrickson dominated racing at Long Island. Tony Ferrante. I used to watch you know, him race at Islip Speedway. Oh, but, well that car won, uh, at Islip. It was Islip track champion, Freeport track champion, yeah. and uh, it was also the Wall Stadium track champion. And this car won the very first modified race that I ever raced in, in 1979. So he used to have a pl little Playboy bunny somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's still on there. It's <laughs> yeah. This car is special because Jim Hendrickson was, he was special when I ran Wall Stadium. And if you knew Jim, you know, Jim, pure white hair. Oh. Perfectly all the women clean, used to white, love white fire suit. Yep. And he used to drive in white tennis shoes. Yeah, and, and all the women in the grandstands would cheer. That was their guy. And I remember my, the first time racing with Jim. And again, he won that modified race that night, but they were about to lap me and the caution came out. And so I'm riding around there under caution and Jim pulls up alongside of me and he's smoking a cigarette and he looks at me and he goes like, and he was just letting me know, hey kid, we're coming. This is at Wall? At Wall Stadium, 1979. And the car next to it, the 303, I got that man's autograph when I was about 11 or 12 years old at East Windsor Speedway. I always loved that car. Bumped into his son down here who worked for Richard Childress. Oh, and I man. said, hey, how's your dad? And he said, he's doing good, doing good. And I said, man, I used to love that coupe. <laughs> Does he still have it? And, and he said, yeah, he still got it. And I said, man, would he ever sell it? And he said, I don't know. Why don't you ask him? He lives closer to you than he does me. Turned out that he had moved down here <laughs> several years ago and this car was still sitting in a warehouse. And I, it went down there and I just, I begged and pleaded and, uh, and he finally sold me that car. I mean, so, look at like, like how the crude welding. It's probably done with a gas welder or something, right? Or a stick. You know, these cars were home built, you yeah. know, back then. And a lot of it, not and not really with great tubing and whatnot. A lot of it was plumbing, mechanical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black iron pipe, so and they look, were heavy. Look where the engine was. Holy mackerel! It's almost a mid-engine. Jeez. Unrestored. I love it, man. Yeah, that <laughs> that still has dirt on it from Flemington Speedway, 1973. That that police car. What's the story? That looks familiar. Oh, of course it does. That's one of the Blues Brothers. Uh, that's not a movie car. It's basically a show car. Uh -huh. But the speaker and everything works. And we drive it around. When we're advertising our Americana car show, oh, we funny. drove it around Davidson and Mooresville dressed as the Blues Brothers with the speaker on 
and people were running out of uh, running out of the restaurants and bars taking pictures of it so we use it we have fun with it we're going to use it at the uh, at the upcoming auto fair but it gets it gets as much attention as any other car that i have here especially when you go down the road making announcements what else we got so what what's behind the door over there oh we got more junk and again just please, please tell fans, Ray is normally not this organized. But you said barn fine, Hunter. It's yeah. more like a flea market lately. <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to go through there, but there's, there's cars back there that I got from Rick Hendrick, my two modified cars, and the, the car that's responsible for me and Jeff Gordon being together. I didn't know you were together. Me and Jeff Gordon? Oh, I thought it was Jeff Gordon. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Always, wait a minute. Are you all right? Are you okay? No, uh, I get it. All right, yeah, there was a little piece of uh, Ray's life that we won some championships. Yeah. Brought Dodge back into NASCAR, was a team owner. You know, like, we're looking at all this stuff, like, but that's the thing people know you for, right? Yeah, but, you know, what the cool part is, it's been such a really good transition for me from the racing to, to doing the restoration and doing the concours and the shows and stuff, because I'm, I'm meeting these great people yeah, and like yeah, it's yeah. A, like the stories the stories that come with the cars are incredible yeah, I mean yeah. uh, like what, what you do like I could sit there and just binge watch you guys you know like it's just <laughs> because every every car everything you find has got a story I okay. drive somehow I don't go to the movies often but I think I remember seeing this in a movie that car may be when people ask you what's your favorite car I fell in love with this car 1973, I was 15 years old. It was in the movie American Graffiti. And all I, I dreamt about this car and that movie and every car guy did. And as time went by and I, I got some more resources, I started to search the car out. And oh, yeah. I had always kept track. The guy had it and didn't want to sell it. And, and then finally I gave up on it and we got another one and started to say, well, let's, we'll just build a replica. I was doing the Americana show and we're doing a show on Hollywood cars. I walk into this place and uh, I said, oh, you've got, a, you've got a replica of the, and they're like, no, that's it. We're doing some work on it, it's going to auction. And it went to auction at numbers I couldn't compete with. And the auction company called me and we kept negotiating for about you know, six, eight months. And I, you know, I kept saying, no, this is all the money I have. I will pay you that, but I don't have any more. And they said, well, how about this? Well, no, I can't do that. Well, how about this? I can't do it. So in another six or eight months, they finally said, okay, we'll take the money that you want. We'll at least, will you at least pay to ship it? And uh, got our friends from Exalta to help offset the cost of doing it. But this is the most extensive restoration project on a streetcar that we've ever done and I'll tell you why we wanted to use every single part that it was on the car in the movie we have the original tires and wheels um, they're not sitting on it right now because yeah. they're not really safe but we had Exalta came in and scanned the paint and did testing to make so we could match the color because it was originally painted uh, with lacquer just over red you gotta remember it was a movie car all of these stripes, they just taped them on and painted them. They weren't the same. We digitized <laughs> the car from front to back to, so that we could make it perfectly so and perfect So they're not again. the same still? No, no. And, wow. you know, trying to match the fog and the fade out, again, because it was probably taped off and sprayed with a spray can. So yeah. we went through all that. We took the nuts and bolts out of the car, had them cleaned and replated so we could use them all. The only things that we changed were consumables like brake pads and ball joints and tie rods, things that would make it unsafe to drive. The gentleman that had it actually cracked the block. It had a 348 with a single carburetor in it and a three speed for the movie. But in the movie, if you remember, Candy Clark, um, sit, you know, Debbie says to Toad, hey, will it peel out? And he said, ah, I got a 327 with six Strombergs. You know how hard it is to find a 1962 327 and six Stromberg manifold? So we, we searched, we got that. The interior had faded, it was torn in some spots. I got with Bobby Alloway, a uh, good friend, famous hot rod builder. We took the interior out of this car and took it to his interior guy who searched and found <laughs> rolls of material from the same manufacturer, mm. completely re-dyed the material, the interior, fixed it. This is the original interior from the movie. It's not, it, it's so it's been even repaired. It is repaired wow. and re-dyed, but it is 100% the original interior. We added the carpet because they said, believe it or not, in the movie, they just had rugs and like that white fur and whatnot. So we put a carpet in it. The, the headliner, door panels, everything from the movie 
interiors in there. The only thing we did, we had to replace the window. They, in the movie, they said, we want shaved door handles to make it look good. But they didn't put any buttons to open it, so somebody rolled up the window, shut the door. They were running behind on, hey, let's, let's <laughs> film this. They broke the window. That's why in the movie, you never see the windows up in this no. car because it had no, had no window. They broke it out to keep it going. So how do you, is there a way to open it now? There's not. There's not. Still. Yeah, we leave the window down. And in the movie, he leaves it in reverse and he backs into a guy. Remember, he's going to race the guy and then he forgets him. Mm -hmm. He backed into it. I left the dent. I said, don't uh. fix that. Because, you know, that's where that, that bumper went up wow. and, and, and bent that, you know, it, it's just, I wanted that the same. So this is a 59 caddy tail. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted the, I wanted it to be really like it was in the movie mm -hmm. because it, it, you know, it was rough. It needed some, needed some attention, but I didn't want to change it. And you haven't done many street cars, have you? Not many. No, yeah, yeah. no. So another modified. Tommy Baldwin. Wow. Yeah, this Tom Baldwin Sr., who unfortunately lost his life in a modified at, uh, at um, Thompson Speedway in 2004. But Tom, Tom incredible car builder, incredible car builder. Uh, I've, I, I raced quite a bit with Tom Sr. And Tom Jr. actually worked for me for a while wow. when he, you know, he, he was Casey Kane's crew chief when I started my team. This particular car ended up being the 1975 Wall Stadium track champion with another guy driving it, a guy named Joe Severich, who was kind of a local guy. So, so much history connected to my younger racing days, the way that they built these cars. If you look at this, this is still, this would have been, I believe, 54 Chevy frame rail, uh, but they used to take Chrysler lower control arms and, and torsion bars with, with a Lincoln Continental upper control arm. And just go to the junkyard. And, and that's stuff. how they would get yeah. it. And if you look yeah. at it, all they did was really copy that stuff as we were going forward and make that out of tubing. A lot of the geometry on these early cars is still kind of what existed up until the, into the 90s, really, until we got on all the crazy stuff. So bump would they stops have used power steering in the day? I can't answer that on, yeah, on yeah, when it was yeah. first built, but you figure this ran Islip, Freeport, but they probably, with these short tracks, because they always had pretty big tires, you know, yeah, Modifieds yeah, yeah. always had pretty big tires. And, but again, I don't know if you remember Tom Baldwin Sr., but yeah, he's not a guy you would yeah, want to right. get into a fight with. That's why he won a lot of races on the island, I think, because nobody wanted to pass him. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Yeah, you're bringing back a lot of names that I haven't thought oh, about yeah. in a long time. And then we'll go into the shop where the guys are uh, hammering on some other things. Wow. So this is not something I would imagine that would be in Ray Everham's shop. Not the old Ray Everham, but, but the new Ray Everham <laughs> has found so many interesting things. Uh -huh. and, and as time goes on, but you know, I look at cars as, as works of arts and I, I love the story uh, with cars. And this car is called a Ferret and it, this is Ferret One. And it was built by a man named Peter Dawson. Where Peter in, the, has a, in the states? Uh, he bought. He built it in Michigan. But Peter was uh, had worked for Colin Chapman over in England and learned his trade over there. Then became a, a Chrysler engineer. And Peter hand built this car. Raced, raced it as H modified, a four cylinder Crosley engine, and it is aluminum and magnesium. And this is the original body. My guys totally restored this car. I, I've got some, I've got guys here that I would put up against anybody in the business. Metal wise, they saved all the magnesium parts and aluminum parts. They, they, they had to recreate that tunnel, but everything else is, is the same. So what, what does this car weigh in race? It weighs rate? 900 pounds with that Crosley motor in it. And these are the original tires and wheels that were on the car. And Tom, what, what's really neat about this car, it's built out of the pieces from a wrecked Seata. So a guy named Jan Muller wrecked a Seata, and he and Pete Dawson took the pieces off that. It's got Seata hubs, Seata st uh, steering. See, you know, we went back um, and got the, the Italian sports car book and found the numbers. And so the car's got some legitimate, legitimate history. I mean, this car speaks to me. This is my thing. Holy mackerel. You know, so this is a one of one. Well, it's a one of one ferret, the front engine car, but he also built another one that we're in the process of restoring now that's called Ferret 2. Wow. This one actually, I guess you'd call this a mid-engine car, but it had a three-cylinder uh, Mercury outboard. And as you can see, my guys right now, the original fenders, original meta, they take the stuff apart, they, clean, they, they work it through the, in, the yep. English wheel, they work really hard based off of pictures. They, you get as much time doing research 
and pictures and things as, as anything else. Like every other race car, you've got to find a, the ear that you <coughs> want to restore it to. Mm -hmm. But we have found some really original pictures of, of oh, this man. car as well. Also built in Michigan. Yeah, also in, in, in Pete's garage. So it was basically a bunch of Chrysler engineers that got together oh, and, oh, and their weekends and at night and built cars. So an, yet another IROC car. This one is a car that was driven to victory at Riverside by Peter Gregg. And again, because of, of going to Amelia Island and things like that with you, I, even though I had worked with Hurley Haywood in the 80s, uh, I've gotten to spend a lot more time yeah, yeah, yeah. reading about Hurley and, and Peter Gregg and the things that they did. So we restored this car back to the uh, Peter Gregg. It's going to be shown in a, in a couple of weeks, but it runs, drives. Very cool. So this is something I ask a lot of people, and you'll be perfect for it. If I took away all your cars and you could have one car back, what would it be? That is, um, man, that's like, whew. <laughs> that's like, Gosh almighty. You know, I've chased that American graffiti car since I was a kid. So I've never dreamt about having any car longer than that one. The ghost <laughs> is closed. So I couldn't, could I have, could I have two? <laughs> Can you have two? Yeah, okay. So, you know, here are two guys from the Northeast who came down to Charlotte to get involved in racing. And, you know, we both were there and now we're here and Ray is doing his best to find old race cars and, and bring them back to a condition that we could all appreciate them. I mean, tell me, like, what's your, what's your dream? Are you living the dream? I really am, I, and that's the truth. And you know, you can't, you don't get to write your own script because you can never write it as good as it's gonna turn out. I have been so fortunate and so blessed. I mean, meeting people like you and hundreds or thousands of other people, but just to learn the stories of these cars. And I said, I don't know if you and I are, curators but and I, I love talking about these cars more than anything people go how could you remember mm, so much mm, well mm. that's why I want to talk about them because the older I get I don't know if I'll be able to remember you know what we remember when we were the young guys yeah I it, do hey it's been fun <laughs> growing old with you man well we got more to do we got yeah. plenty more to do <laughs>